Well, last March, when we began to make our way through the book of Exodus, I began by comparing it to uh, one of the great masterpieces. I think of the time standing with Elizabeth before the David, Michelangelo's great statue in uh, Florence, and just being awestruck by, the, awestruck by the power of that, or in the Louvre and looking at the, uh, the Mona Lisa and, and, and wondering about that. And we know the reality of uh, understanding the masterpieces that are there. And so we think about Ephesians, and I called it God's masterpiece. Now, there's other parts of it, and yet it is the, one of the truly great books of the New Testament. It and Romans and the book of John, I think, stand out among all of it, which is all given by God. But it's one thing about a human masterpiece. We stand before it, and we admire it, we appreciate it, we honor the painter or the sculptor who did that particular thing. But when we stand before God's masterpiece in scripture, we don't admire Paul, although we're thankful for him, but we're taken to the, the greater owner of those things. God himself, who brought it into being. But we're not called just to admire it. We're called to appropriate it, to make it our own to live in the truths of which it speaks. About 75 years ago, a woman named Ruth Paxson uh, wrote a, a wonderful little book on the book of Ephesians, and she titled it, The Wealth, The Walk, and The Warfare of the Christian. And it became one of those books and one of those titles that became known everywhere. And she was talking about Hebrews, the wealth of the Christian. That's Pardon me, Ephesians. That's Ephesians chapters 1 to 3. And as we think about Ephesians chapter 1 and 3, she was thinking probably of chapter 1 verse 3 that says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. And what we have in the first three chapters is our position in Christ, our blessings in Christ, all that God has given us in Christ. And then we go to chapter 4, and Paul begins chapter 4 by saying, walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. And five or six times in chapters 4 to 6, Paul will use that phrase, walk, walk in the spirit, walk in the light, don't walk as children of the day, to talk about our daily life. And then at the end, of course, he talks about Put on the whole armor of God. Our wrestling isn't against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. We're talking about warfare. Watchman Nee was a Chinese church planter who was used by God greatly in China. Uh, before, he ended up dying uh, as a martyr under the Ch when the Ch uh, Chinese communists took over the country. But he wrote a book called Sit, Walk, Stand. Same idea, only he took sit from that marvelous phrase that we have in Ephesians chapter 2. But God, who is rich in love toward us, even when we were dead in sins, for by grace you saved, made us alive together in Christ and raised us up together and caused us sit together in heavenly places so that in the ages to come, he might display in us the innumerable riches of Christ. Sit, walk, stand. But what I want you to notice is this. We begin the book of Ephesians in the heavenlies. We end the book of Ephesians in the trenches. Because all of those blessings that are ours call us to live in a world that is difficult and challenging in a way that honors and glorifies God. So we fill our mind with these things that are true for us, but now we're to live it out. And that's why the last part of the book, in some ways, applies all that Paul has said and presses it into our lives. So take your Bibles and let's turn to the very ending 
of the book of Ephesians. We're going to be looking at verses 18 to the end, but we're going to read beginning at verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel in all circumstances and in the original text, and I'll explain this in a minute, in all circumstances, taking up the shield of faith with which you extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil ones and taking the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to the, to the end, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So that you may also know how I am and what I am doing. Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will, send, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace to the brothers, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with you all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an, I th like the translation better, with an unceasing love. The glory of the United States, one of the glories is the Declaration of Independence. And woven deeply into American history and American hearts and life is that statement, that we are a free people and we're not under the authority of any king who's over in England. It's interesting that in some ways, the glory of a Christian is a declaration of de Dependence. The recognition that we are not self-sustaining, self-affirming, self-capable people, but that we are dependent and we need to recognize that dependence honestly and in that process we find the freedom that we love. If the sun will set you free, you will be really free, the Lord Jesus said. Now, we've noticed as we've been looking at this passage that it's talking about the reality that we're involved in spiritual warfare. And over the last few weeks, we've talked about verses 10 to 17. Let me just encapsulate that. These are sort of battle, battle realities of our Christian faith. First, we need to understand that we live in a spiritual war zone. That our life as Christians is lived in a place that is under enemy control. And so Paul makes it very clear that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against spiritual powers in high places. Not against simply human people, but Satan himself claims the place in which we live. And as we live our life as Christians... We live it in some way as people who have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, but there's a constant conflict in which we're self, and we are not able either to escape the reality that we're living against the culture around us, whatever its form is, and we're living against powers that are greater than ourselves. 
And so that's where Paul begins. Strengthen yourself in the Lord and in his mighty strength. Put on the whole armor that you may be able to stand in the day of evil against the wicked one, against these spiritual forces. So if the first thing he wants us to understand, the Christian life is going to be challenging. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be lived in the trenches because of the great cosmic battle that it's part of. The second thing he wants us to understand is that God has provided us with what we need in Christ to live the Christian life. And so that's why verse 10 calls us to remember, put on, or pardon me, be strong in the, in, the, in the Lord Jesus and in his glorious might, in his strength. And one of the great statements about the early part of the book, it constantly reminds us of the power of God that is available to us in, the, in Christ. I pray, Paul says, that you may be strengthened with might by a spirit in the inner man. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may know what it is to live in a way that honors the Lord, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. That you may know the love of Christ, which passes comprehension. That was all true. It was misquoted out of order. But all of those things that are said in that particular way that we need the strength in a constant way of the Lord. And so Paul has written, be filled with the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit and know those things in our life. Now Paul wants us to understand in verse 18 that we have a resource that we need constantly to lay hold of. We need to have put on the armor of God. We need to be applying the great truths of chapters 1 to 3 especially to our lives. That's putting on the armor of God. But we need to be praying. And so verses 18 to 20 end the book really in terms of what it's saying to teach us by reminder of the priority of prayer in our lives. In a war zone, two things are critical. Lines of communication and lines of supply. If people are on the front lines, don't have the equipment that they need to do what they need to do, then they can't possibly be victorious. And on the other hand, if they don't have some sense of where they are to go and what they are to do because the commander is directing them in this particular way, they're going to be isolated and made vulnerable in particular ways. And when Paul now subjects or turns to the subject of prayer, He wants us to recognize that that is the vital lifeline between us as we live in this world, seeking to live a life that honors and glorifies God. It's not part of the armor. It is the way the armor operates. I want you to notice that back in verse 14, we had a command. Stand, therefore. It was picking up what had been said earlier. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Verse 13, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand and having done all to stand firm, stand. And then he says stand having put on the armor. And he talks about those pieces of armor that we talked about, those six things that go from verse 14 to 17. And there's only one main verb in this whole section, and it's the the verb stand. Now he comes back and talks about, after you've put on the armor, stand praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end, Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. In other words, prayer is essential, even though we're equipped and we've got on the armor. Unless we're in communication with the Father and living our life prayerfully, we cannot live as the way God wants us to live in contrast to the world, which is moving against us. 
Now he uses a phrase that's only, he is the only time he uses it. It's used in the book of Jude as well. He says, praying in the spirit. Let me first of all say what that doesn't mean, although many have used it in that way. It's not talking about praying in tongues. Paul makes that very clear because in 1 Corinthians 12, he makes it clear that every Christian doesn't have the gift of tongues. So he could hardly command us to pray in a way that God has not equipped us to pray. Praying in the Spirit, and it's also used in Jude chapter 20, or Jude verse 20, when it says praying in the Spirit and then keeping on living in a way that honors God. To pray in the Spirit is to pray, well, you'll notice verse 17 ended by talking about the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So in some way, it means Scripture needs to guide you because the Spirit is the one who brought into being the Word of God. But the Spirit also is the one who moves in our heart to give us a sense of our need and our direction. And we have that wonderful verse in Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27, when he says, we don't know what we should pray for, as we should. But the Spirit searches our heart. And he who, pardon me, the Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who so searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is. For he makes intercession for us according to the will of God. And, and there's a certain way of praying in which we come into the presence of the Lord and we say, Lord, I don't even know what to pray about this. But, but by your Spirit, takes, take the things that are on my heart and, and, and present it to the Father. Help me to know what I should be praying for and how I should pray. To pray in the Spirit is to pray sensitively and directed by the Spirit. Now, I want you to notice with me that in verse 18, there are four alls. And we could call them the, the universals of prayer. So let's think our way through them. We won't do it in precisely the same order. Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. So we are to pray with all prayers. What does that mean? I think it means all kinds of prayer. Prayers of thanksgiving, prayers of repentance, prayers of petition, prayers of lament, prayers of uh, just questions and laying before the Lord. There is no way you can go into the presence of the Father with your burden that isn't appropriate in that particular way. And so as we come to the Father, we need to realize I can say anything. I can ask anything. I can confess everything. I am able to be fully open in the presence of the Lord. And, and to pray with all prayer is to recognize that there's not some order. It's not to pray mechanically or ritualistically. I was brought up in a context in which prayers, uh, we were taught, needed to be in King James English. And I was good at that. I mean, I'd been brought up in the King James Bible and I could do thou's and shalt's and uh, wherefore's and all of that particular language. And it was real. I'm not in any way demeaning people who are like that. And there was major conflict. Some of you uh, will struggle with this. Is it right to pray you rather than thee or thou? And I remember in my... First of all, when I took Greek and I realized there was no difference in the words, that ended that particular idea. But just the freedom to pray conversationally and not in these great prayers of people who I valued them and I love them, but it was like listening to something from a couple of centuries ago when they prayed. Pray with all prayer. Bring your heart to the Lord. Pray, secondly, on all occasions. Now that doesn't mean do nothing but pray, but it does mean do nothing without prayer. 
that prayer becomes saturated and linked into our life in such a way that we come into the presence of God or all of these various things and it is normal for us to have open communication with the Father. It is good to set times of prayer and that is entirely appropriate. But at the same time, there's a call of scripture to be praying without ceasing, as Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 5 and and verse 16, which is a word that is very meaningful to me now because that without ceasing means with a hacking cough. And I've been irritated with this cough for a while, but Paul is talking about pray in in an ongoing regular prayer. Then he says, pray with all perseverance. He uses another word related to that, keep alert with all perseverance. That first word is a word for a soldier who's appointed to be on guard duty and to be alert and watchful. So we need to be alert about the opportunities to pray, to have that as something before us and to persevere in prayer, to recognize that we need, if it's a burden that's still on our heart, there's sometimes when we pray something and we pray and there's a sense of, okay, that burden's off my heart. But sometimes it keeps being there and and we keep praying because the Lord hasn't given us a sense yet that that's been answered in a way that is honoring to him. So we're to pray all prayer on all occasions with all perseverance for all the saints. Now, what he's talking about, the fact is that there's a communal responsibility of prayer. We're part of a family. We're part of believers who come together. And if I'm part of a local church family, I'm called to be praying for my brothers and sisters in Christ. I can't pray for every Christian in the world, but it's a Reminder that I don't just pray for me and Elizabeth and our family and then not worry about those outside. But what do we pray? Well, when we pray for all the saints, Paul is talking about praying in a context of our struggle to live godly lives in a world that is opposing where we're going. And I want you to think a little bit about that because when we pray, much of our prayer is about real concerns, about physical needs, that we know if someone is having an operation, someone has a disease, someone has this. They can be about personal problems and those are righteous and appropriate. But Paul wants us to pray in the light of the mission mission we have to be God's people in the world, to live in a way that's honoring him. So when he prays, he prays, as I've already quoted, that that I pray for you, that you might be strengthened with might by the spirit in the inner man, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all sense what is the height and length and breadth and depth and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. How often do we pray prayers like that for our brothers and sisters. Or to go back to Ephesians chapter one, when he says, I pray for you, that you may know what is the hope to which he's called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? What is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ? And and those are prayers that go deeper into thinking about, as we think about someone, not just to pray for their physical health, but their spiritual growth and their witness for Christ in the world. So even as we think about whom we're praying for, there's a worthwhile question about what are we praying for in terms of what we're asking for them. And maybe as a kind of example, Paul now asks them to pray for him. So verses 19 to 20, are Paul asking for personal prayer. He does that regularly in the uh, the New Testament. And something of what we might be praying for others. Now, admittedly, Paul's unique. 
He's an apostle. He has a unique ministry. He's the spiritual father of these people. And yet there's truths behind it. But let's think about where Paul is. Did you notice that phrase that's used here? It's a, it's a highly ironic one when he says in verse 20, the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Ambassadors don't wear chains. Ambassadors had immunity. That's the whole thing about being an ambassador. You send an ambassador to another country, and if you were to take an ambassador and put them in chains, that's a declaration of war. And there's all kinds of evidences even in history in that. One of the great stories of the United Nations of the United States related to Pearl Harbor is that Chinese ambassadors on the very day that they were bombing Pearl Harbor were uh, coming to the White House and saying they had no intention of doing it and, and all of the lies that were going on back and forth. But the Americans didn't immediately put them in chains. Even the Japanese uh, ambassadors uh, at, at that occasion. What's Paul's condition? He's on trial for his life before Nero. He's in Rome. He's been falsely accused. The Jewish leaders in Jerusalem manipulated what he had done, made a false claim that he'd taken a Gentile into the court. There was a riot in the city. He was arrested mainly for his own protection. He later appeared before the Roman leaders in uh, Caesarea Maritima, Caesarea by the sea it, there. And they said, you know, if he hadn't appealed to Caesar, we could set him free. So they shipped him to Caesar and the Jewish leaders followed him there. And they were now going to accuse him seeking his death. He's an innocent man who's been manipulated and put into this particular position. Paul's not a prisoner of the Romans or of Nero. He's a prisoner of Christ. And he's about to stand before Vladimir Putin. That would be as close as we can come in this context. And what's he pray for? And you notice he prays for three things. He prays for clarity, that a word might be given to me. Help me to know what to say. Do you remember the promise Jesus made to his disciples? He said that when you're on trial, don't worry about what to say. The Spirit will give it to you. Well, you know, pray for me that I may have clarity. And the second thing he asked for is boldness. That with all boldness, that he would speak what needs to be said and he would do it confidently and boldly in that particular way. And the third thing he asked for is faithfulness, that I may open my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. And what he looks for is the opportunity to speak boldly to Nero himself to share the gospel. Well, how did that turn out? I love what you read in the, you turn over the leaf in your Bible, or at least in mine, to Philippians chapter 1. And he says, what has happened to me has served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial court, and to all the rest, my imprisonment is for Christ. And more, more of the brethren, having been confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So Paul doesn't ask for release. He doesn't act, ask for uh, the, the approval or a declaration of innocence. He asks for faithfulness and clarity and boldness so the gospel may be promoted. And sometimes as we pray for people, our first temptation is to pray, well, our first response is to pray for their release. But sometimes we need to pray for their faithfulness and boldness and confidence and clarity as they speak the truth of the gospel of Christ.
And now he's finished. What he wants to say has come to an end. Nearly always in all of the books he writes at this point, he would go on to say, and give my greetings to so and so, and my greetings to so and so, and my greetings to someone else. But he doesn't do that here. And people have wondered why, because he knew people in Ephesus very well. And the answer is we don't quite sure, but this is probably a letter that he wanted to send around to a variety of churches. And he talks about the man to whom he's given the responsibility to bring the letter, a man named Tychicus. We don't know a lot about Tychicus. We know he's an Asian. That means he comes from the region around Ephesus. We also know that almost certainly that he's a Gentile. His name means lucky, which is not a Jewish name by any stretch of the imagination. And he's also one of the group of people who Paul gathers together to take money gathered from the churches up in Greece to the church in Jerusalem. And Paul was, at that time, on this group of people. They came to Jerusalem, present money to the church in Jerusalem from Gentile churches to say, we're your brothers in Christ. We know you're under persecution. We you know that you're having a famine. And Gentiles were sent to help Paul bring this to represent the Jewish church to show the unity of the body of Christ, which is what the book of Ephesians is all about. You who are all once far off are made near by the blood of Christ. And Tychicus was one of those models of we've been made near by the blood of Christ. But as I've already said, Paul was arrested. He was thrown into jail. He was left in some way to rot in jail for two years while Festus and then Felix, the Roman governors, played games with him. And finally he was sent. Tychicus apparently stayed with him through that time. When Paul was sent to Rome, Tychicus made his way to Rome to be with Paul. That's why Paul calls him faithful servant and a beloved brother kind of person who's there in the deepest of challenges and the deepest of difficulties. He's still in that trial. But Paul says, Tychicus, I've got a job for you. I want you to go to your home area and I want you to carry a letter I've written to the church of Colossae. I've never visited it before, but I want you to take it there so that they can learn the truth of the gospel directly from me. And I've got a man I want you to take along with me. His name's Zenesimus. He's a brother in Christ. But he's also a slave of a man named Philemon, who lives in the area of Colossae. And I want you to take him back, and I want you to give this letter to Philemon. And I expect Philemon to set Onesimus free. There's no room for a brother to be an owner of a Christian slave. And I want you to take this letter to Ephesus. And I want you to tell them how I am. Because I know they're concerned about me. I know they're thinking about me. Tell them the state of affairs. But Tychicus, I want you to encourage them in the Lord. And I can't prove that. But I think that Tychicus maybe read the letter. And he would stop and they would have questions. What does that mean? How do you understand that? And Tychicus would help them understand what Paul was saying when he was saying these various things. And there's something about a man who just was a faithful servant. He was a postman doing the work of God, not in a major way, but he was a faithful brother and servant. And it's a reminder to us that our calling isn't to be Paul's, nearly always. It's just to be like Tychicus, faithful in the place that God has put us, doing what brings glory to our Lord. And then the book ends. It ends in a relatively normal way. Peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then a specific benediction. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus.
with an unending love. It's interesting that the book began, Grace to You and Peace. It ends with grace. And at the heart of it is that statement that's the most statement, famous statement in the book of Ephesians. By grace, you were saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. From beginning to end, the work of God in our lives is based on his grace and his gift in Christ. And one of the great privileges is we look up to heaven on the basis of what Christ has done for us. And we pray not, oh, great creator, not even God, the mighty one, but father, father. And we come as children into his presence to ask what's on our heart. We know prayer is important. The challenge is, and I say this in my own life, I don't always remember it's essential. It's not simply an option in my life. It's an essential part of living in a way that will glorify our God. And inevitably, when we talk about prayer, we feel guilty. And rightly so, because most of us have prayer lives that aren't what we know God wants it to be. The answer to that is, begin where you are. You're never going to get all the way there overnight. But begin where you are by making prayer a more pointed part of your life as you live in the trenches for the glory of God. And it's all of grace and God's good gift to us. And that's what we celebrate when we come to the table Sunday by Sunday. To remember in his great goodness, God sent his son. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus that though he was rich for our sakes, he became poor, that we through his poverty might be rich. He's asked us to remember his body given for us, his blood shed for us. And so we do. This is the table of the Lord Jesus, not the table of Redeemer Fellowship. If you know and trust him, he invites you to take these symbols in remembrance of him. If you've not trusted him, God's grace is there for you. If you will only open your heart and trust in his salvation. We're going to sing after I pray distribute the symbols and we'll take them together after I've sung. Father, as we survey the cross, fill our hearts with wonder of the riches, the wealth that is ours in Christ for all that is ours because he gave himself for us. And as we sing and honor your son, our father, we ask, that you would enable us to remember with our hearts of love his grace to us in, in his death and resurrection. In his name we pray, amen.